Praise the Lord. Good morning and welcome to service. We thank God for another Sunday God has gifted us that we can come together to worship our Lord. This morning's scripture reading will be taken from the book of Psalms chapter 113. I'll be reading from verses 1 through 4 in the NIV version. Psalms 113 is a great psalm of praise unto the Lord. Verse 1. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord you his servants. Praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be praised both now and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is exalted over all the nations. His glory above the heavens. May God bless us with the reading of his word. Psalms 113 begins and ends with praise the Lord. It is an exhortation to praise God. The psalmist is reminding us from start to end of the day his name is to be praised. Why do we praise the Lord and why his name to be praised? Verse 4 says God's name ought to be praised in every place from east to west for he is high and lifted up his glory above the heavens above all nations the psalmist is asking who is like unto the lord our god there is none like jehovah may the lord bless us with these words let us pray Father we thank you we praise you we bless you our father which art in heaven hallowed be your name we worship and praise the one who sits and throned on high you alone are worthy to receive glory honor and praise i will bless the lord at all times your praise shall continue to be in my mouth help us to worship you in spirit and in truth may our praise reach heaven as an aroma of incense lord bless the service this morning help us to be in your presence with a grateful heart offering thanksgiving and praise lift the hearts and spirits of the people who are heavy laden and stressed help us to experience your joy your healing your peace Anoint your servant as he brings forth the word. Open our hearts and minds to receive your word, to honor and to obey you. Bless the worship team from their heart and joy in serving you. Bless every family to draw nearer to you with a renewed spirit and heart. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen.
May God's name be praised. And this morning we come gladly into God's presence as he gives us one more opportunity to do so, to worship him and to meditate on his word. So here we are yet another Sunday, wondering what is happening to the world, to God's world. In this time of confusion and chaos, there is one word that describes the condition of every person living on the earth. And that word is waiting. Everyone seems to be waiting for something. How long will this pandemic last? How long before life returns to normal, whatever normal means? But not everyone waits the same way. Those who do not know God, they look to the creation for solution. But the people of God look to the creator for salvation. This morning, in our brief time together, we will look at how God's people can wait on him through difficult times. God is always on time. He is never early and he is never late. God's timing is perfect because he is sovereign and good. We read in Psalm 115 and verse 3, Our God is in the heavens and he does whatever he pleases. We read in Psalm 135 and verse 6, Whatever the Lord pleases, he does in the heavens and in earth and in the seas and in all deeps. And as his children, we must learn to wait upon him. But waiting is such a difficult thing to do. Waiting for someone to come out of surgery. Waiting for a job opportunity. Waiting for a career that enables us to use our gifts while also providing for our families, waiting for a loved one to be healed, waiting for a loved one to be saved, waiting for people to change, 
waiting for a personal word from God that will make sense of our situations, waiting for an answer to a prayer that we have been praying for many months and perhaps even many years. But no matter what the reason for the wait is, it is difficult for the person who is going through it. And how we wait is important. How we face trials will reveal something about us. Our response to suffering will reveal what we truly think of God. Our response to suffering will reveal what we think of God's purposes for our life. We may not have all the answers for suffering, but God reveals himself to be good. God cannot and God will not do evil. Everything God does is good. But the Bible also teaches us that we live in a sin-stricken, God-cursed, broken world. God's children may encounter suffering and trials. When we read Hebrews 11, the cloud of witnesses includes those who were stoned and those who were put to death with the sword. The Lord Jesus cautions us that we will have tribulation in the world. But even though we do not have all the answers, God has given us enough revelation to trust him. In the Bible, God reveals some fundamental truths that will help us face life with confidence. Firstly, nothing happens in the life of the believer without the knowledge and permission of God. When we read the book of Job, we find that Satan is on a leash, and that too, a tight leash. Secondly, everything that God does, he does in infinite wisdom. Thirdly, everything that God does, he does in perfect love. So when God, who has infinite wisdom and perfect love, when God does something, it ends up bringing him glory and benefiting us. God does not do evil, but in his hands, our trials become powerful tools. He uses our trials to refine us and to mold us into the image of his son. God uses our trials to test the genuineness of our faith. God uses our trials to remove our dependence on the world. Through our trials, God calls us to a heavenly hope. In our trials, God reveals what we truly love. God teaches us obedience. Through our trials, God prepares us for future usefulness. And our suffering equips us to show compassion on others who are suffering. So this morning, let us look at a man who waited on God in very difficult circumstances. Will you turn your Bibles to Psalm 13 and verse 1? Psalm 13 and verse 1. How long, O Lord? This psalm was written by David during a very difficult time in his life. From the text, it is not immediately clear what these difficulties were. But David is clearly fleeing from someone. In verse 2, he mentions an enemy. In verse 4, he mentions enemies. There were at least two occasions in David's life when he was fleeing from someone. After he became king, he fled from his own son, Absalom. But even before he became king, he had to flee from Saul, then king of Israel. Many scholars believe that this was written by David as he fled from Saul. Why would David have to flee from Saul? After David killed Goliath, the people of Israel began to praise David more than they praised Saul. And Saul, being a carnal man, he was given to jealousy. He saw David as a threat to his position. And out of pure jealousy, he began to pursue David. The Bible says that an evil spirit terrorized Saul and he despised David. 
Saul and David shared a very complex relationship. Saul's son, Jonathan, was David's best friend. Saul's daughter, Michael, was David's wife. And so for a period of eight to nine years, Saul has been pursuing David. David has been on the run and he has been hiding. He found refuge in all kinds of places, in fields and forests and mountain caves. There was even a time when he was captured by the Philistines. And to escape from them, David had to pretend that he was a madman. He let saliva drool down his beard. He scribbled on the doors of the king's palace just so that he could escape from them. So David has been running and David has been hiding. But in the back of his mind, he has some questions. As he looks at the past, he thinks of God's promises. And his current reality does not match the promises that he has received. For the believer, this is the crux of our frustration. When there is a gap between a promise and its fulfillment, we become frustrated. David begins to think aloud. Did not Samuel come to my house in Bethlehem searching for me? And when he met me, did he not pour oil on my head and anoint me to be the next king of Israel? If the throne of Israel has been promised to me, then why do I have to suffer like this? Why do I have to be running and hiding like this? Many times as believers, we too ask these questions. Am I not a child of God? Then why am I facing so many difficulties in life? And so David begins this psalm with a sense of frustration. How long, O Lord? This is a psalm of lament. If we look at the neighboring psalms, they all begin with a sense of lament. Psalm 12 begins with the statement, Help, Lord, for the godly man ceases to be. Psalm 10 begins with the statement, Why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide yourself in the time of trouble? We sometimes prefer some psalms over the others. We tend to ignore these psalms because of their negative outlook. But all these psalms are written out of the deep and emotional experiences of the writers as they are moved by the Holy Spirit. And they have been recorded for our benefit. All scripture is inspired and therefore all scripture is profitable. How long, O Lord? When we go on a long journey, our children might ask, are we there yet? How much longer? And for David, this journey seems to have gone a bit too long. The constant running and hiding have worn him out. God, are you done with your purposes? In the Bible, the how long question is asked when one person is disappointed with another person. God himself has asked this question many times. God asked Pharaoh, how long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? When the Israelites went searching for manna on the seventh day, God asked, How long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my instructions? The Lord Jesus asked, O unbelieving generation, how long shall I be with you? Job asked his friends, How long will you torment me and crush me with your words? But how long? is a question that man has asked God many times. In the book of Psalms alone, this, book, this question has been asked about 18 times. Throughout history, people of God have cried out to him and asked, How long, O Lord? Maybe we know someone, or maybe we are that someone who has been asking, How long? But this is a question that will be asked in the future. Revelation chapter 6 and verse 10 says that the cries of the martyrs will reach heaven 
How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood? In this season of pandemic, we hear many godly believers ask, How long, O Lord, till you relent your hand? David's heart is swollen with sorrow, and he bursts out the how long question four times in a row. In an explosion of four how long questions, David pours his heart before God. But before we go further, it is important to address a question. Is it okay to question God like this? Beloved, when a believer cries in this manner, he is not rebelling against God. He or she is rising against sin. Sin that has vandalized the perfect shalom of God. This is not bitterness. Strange as it may sound, this is a longing for God's patience to run out. This is the longing for a restoration of God's kingdom, where God, the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, where he will rule in all righteousness. This is a sacred discontent that is felt by the godly. But David's pain has become too intense. This is a short psalm with just six verses. And to better grasp its message, we can divide it into three parts and capture three glimpses of David. In verses 1 and 2, we see a David who is suffering. David asks four how long questions. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart all the day? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? In his outburst, David refers to three players. He looks at God, he looks at his enemies, and he then looks at himself. And the gist of his argument is this, I am hurting, you have forgotten, and they are winning. And the first thing he says is, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? This is a stunning question because of who is asking it. This is not asked by Saul, who stood 40 days before the enemy, crippled by fear, and unsure of action. This is asked by the hero of Israel, the one who smote the giant with one pebble. This is the cry of a godly man who thinks he has reached the end of his rope and feels all alone. In the past, he may have seized the lion or the bear by its hair, and he may have killed it, but right now he feels all alone. Beloved, Scripture shows us that even the giants of the faith needed to feel lonely so that God could pour grace into their lives so that His power might be made perfect in weakness. A.W. Tozer said, It is necessary for God to use the hammer, the file, and the furnace in His holy work of preparing a saint for true sainthood. Toza said, It is doubtful whether God can bless a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. David feels that God has forgotten him. But what makes this question stunning is who this question is addressed to. Will God forget David? Who was David after all? He was just a shepherd boy. He was the youngest in the family of many sons. His own brothers did not think highly of him. God plucked him from an obscure village and called him to become king. God will never forget those whom he has called. 
God will not call us and then abandon us midway. His calling is always, always backed up by his power and his love. But the question should not be, will God forget, but can God forget? An omniscient God cannot forget anything. David is aware of God's full knowledge. He asks, or rather he tells in Psalm 139 and verse 4, Before a word is on my tongue, you know it all, O Lord. But now he feels that God has abandoned him. God never forgets his people, but the Bible says that man will forget God. When circumstances changed, God's people often forgot him. Whenever Israel forgot God, it grieved his heart. We read in Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 32, Can a virgin forget his, her ornaments or a bride her attire? Yet my people have forgotten me. There was a time when Israel felt that God had forgotten her. Isaiah chapter 49 and verses 14 says, But Zion said, The Lord has forsaken me, and the Lord has forgotten me. And how did God respond? Can a woman forget her nursing child and have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, but I will never forget you. And as if to prove his point, God says, I have inscribed you in the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. We hear the Lord Jesus say in Luke chapter 12 and verse 6, Are not five sparrows sold for two cents? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. God who does not forget the sparrows, he will not forget the redeemed. God cannot forget, and God will not forget. But there is something that God chooses to forget. He forgets our sin. In Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 34, the Lord promises, I will not remember their sins anymore. What a God to know, and what a God to be known by. Beloved, no matter what storm you are facing today, we have never left the heart and mind of God. Today, when we survey the brokenness of the world, the question should not be, how long will God forget his people? But rather, how long will man continue to forget God? Look at David's second question. How long, O Lord, will you hide your face from me. In the Bible, when one person hides his face from another, it indicates a broken relationship. When God hides his face from man, it is because of his holiness. When man hides his face from God, it is because of fear, guilt, and shame. Adam, Eve, and Cain, they all hid from God out of shame and fear. In the Bible, and especially in the Old Testament, the face of God represents the grace of God. When the Israelites gathered together, the high priest would invoke a very special blessing upon them. We read in Numbers chapter 6 and verse 24. The blessing goes like this. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance on you and give you peace. David has heard this blessing so many times in his life. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. But right now, David feels that God is hiding his face. It is this David who wrote in Psalm 27 that he wanted to behold the beauty of the Lord. It is this David who said in Psalm 139, Where can I go from your spirit, or where can I flee from your presence? Beloved, is there a basis for such fear? Will God forget and forsake us? 
As New Testament believers, we live in the confidence that God's face is turned in favor towards us because of what His Son accomplished on the cross. For a brief moment in time, the Father hid His face from His Son so that He will never have to hide His face from us. The Son cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And that cry has removed the possibility of God hiding his face from us. When we are so overwhelmed by the trials of life, we may begin to wonder if God truly loves us. Beloved, when we are tempted to doubt the love of God, the place to look is to the cross. On the cross, God has declared once and for all his love towards us. Our afflictions are light and momentary, but the cross declares that God's love is beyond our circumstances. Beloved, what is the greatest hope that we possess? The greatest hope that we possess is that one day we will see the face of God. The Bible ends with the promise that there will be no longer any curse. In that new city will be the throne of God and the throne of the Lamb. His bond servants will serve Him. They will see His face and His name will be on their foreheads. The Apostle John writes in his epistle that we will be like Him because we will see Him just as He is. We will then possess that great eternal weight of glory. Notice David's third question. How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart all the day? David feels empty on the inside. He has probably lost his appetite. He has no reason to get up in the morning. He is covered by a fog of depression. David is reporting his true feelings, and he does not feel so good. Look at David's fourth question. How long will my enemy be exalted over me? David has been in this condition not because of disobedience. It is precisely his obedience to the call of God that he finds himself in this situation. David knows that those who mock him are in fact mocking the God who called him. David thinks that he is on the losing team. When our trials become intense, we are often conflicted. We look around and we see that the godly are suffering especially, whereas the godless seem to be prospering. Beloved, it is important to not lose sight of the fact that we are on the winning team. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers in the heavenly places. Behind every distress we face is the enemy who hates God. But this is a defeated enemy. He may be a prowling lion looking for someone to devour, but he is also a disarmed, defeated, and defanged lion. His doom is certain, and it is imminent. When God arises, his enemies are scattered, and those who hate God flee before him. Beloved, let us not forget the fact that the king is returning for that final lap of victory. In the first two verses, we see a David who is suffering. And in the next two verses, we see a David who is praying. This is the first and foremost response to suffering. David stops dwelling on his problems and he begins to look to the one who can deliver. And so he turns to God. In James chapter 5 and verse 13, we read, Is anyone among you suffering? He must pray. Notice how David addresses God. In verse 3, he calls God, O Lord, my God. The Hebrew words used here are 
Jehovah and Elohim. Jehovah is the personal name of God. That name represents the covenant of a personal God. Elohim represents the power of a mighty God. David turns away from his problems and he looks to the God of promises and power. This is the most important part in this psalm. That God is a promise keeper and that he is powerful. It is because God is a God of promises and a God of power that this psalm even exists. A God of promises gives us hope and what God has promised, he has the power to fulfill. David prays for three things. Firstly, consider me. In your translation, it may say, look upon me or turn to me. Secondly, he cries out, answer me. We face trials with confidence because the living God answers prayer. In this time of the pandemic, when there is so much fear and hopelessness in the world, this is the hope we are called to spread, that the living God answers prayer. In the Old Testament on Mount Carmel, 400 prophets of Baal gathered and they called out, O Baal, answer us. But there was no voice and no one answered. But Elijah was a man just like us. He had a nature just like ours. And he cried out, Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God. And the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and licked the water that was in the trench. Beloved, the question is not whether we believe that God answers prayer. The question is whether prayer is our first resort or our last resort. Do we resort to prayer only when all other options have been exhausted? The greatest resource in the hand of the suffering saint is prayer to the living God who answers. Scripture says that Elijah was just like us. Then in 2020, the God of Elijah can still send fire and send rain in response to the cries of his people. We read this in Jeremiah chapter 33 and verse 3. Call unto me, and I will answer you. I will tell you great things and mighty things that you do not know of. What is David's third request? Enlighten my eyes. In other translations we read, Give light to my eyes. Hiding in a cave for too long can dim our physical eyes. But that's not what David is talking about. David is talking about a new perspective. Our waiting can sometimes dim our vision. During our time of waiting, we are prone to forget the plans and the purposes of God. We sometimes think that our waiting is caused by our inadequacies or God's displeasure with us. We forget that God connects our waiting to hope and to grace. God is not silent about the connection between waiting and grace. Even those who love him most are familiar with his silence. This same David wrote in Psalm 62, My soul waits in silence for God alone. From him is my salvation. Abraham waited to be the father of the nation. Noah waited for the rains to come, and he then waited for the rains to stop. Moses waited for 40 years to be called from leading sheep to leading a nation. Why does God ask us to wait? When we wait, we find God's will in the things that concern us the most. We read this in Lamentations chapter 3 and verse 25. 
The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. Why else does God ask us to wait? God asks us to wait so that we can receive his supernatural strength. We read in Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 31 that those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Why else does God make us wait? God makes us wait so that we can see him work on our behalf. We read in Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 4, God acts for the one who waits for him. Waiting on God is like planting a garden. The seed holds the promise of a harvest, but there is often a season when all that is happening is the watering. God knows how long we must wait. David knows that in a dark and a hopeless cave, what he needs the most is a new and fresh perspective. And David is confident that when all hope is lost, God and God alone can breathe a fresh perspective into his life. Beloved, what is it that enlightens our eyes? If you turn a few pages to the right, we read in Psalm 19 and verse 8, The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. This is the second response to suffering, to search the scriptures for what God is saying. We often pray for those who are suffering. One of the best prayers we can pray for others is that their eyes will be enlightened by the Holy Spirit, that they will receive a new perspective from God. This was Paul's prayer for the believers in Ephesus. He prayed that the eyes of their heart may be enlightened so that they will know three things. The hope of his calling, the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and the surpassing greatness of his power. Hope of his calling, riches of his inheritance, and the greatness of his power. Beloved, when God gives us a new perspective of hope, inheritance, and power, our discouragement simply melts away. Scripture is the antidote for discouragement during trials. Billy Graham once said that a person who is who turns to prayer and to God's word will not remain discouraged for too long. Even when our problems persist, we can still experience peace and joy. In the first two verses, we saw a David who is suffering. In the next two verses, we saw a David who is praying. And in the last two verses, we see a David who is singing. It is the privilege of a believer that even in the midst of suffering, he or she can sing before God. Earlier, we read from James chapter 5 and verse 13 that those who are suffering must pray. But what does the remainder of that verse say? Those who are cheerful must sing praise. David was a skilled musician. But is that why he is singing? The world will not listen to an untalented musician or to someone with a bad voice. But what is the requirement to singing before God? Is it the knowledge of an instrument or the possession of God, a good vocal cords? The only requirement to singing before God is to have joy in the heart. But what is the requirement to singing before God? Is it the knowledge of an instrument or the possession of good vocal cords? The only requirement to singing before God is to have joy in the heart. Joy is not dependent on our circumstances. Joy comes from a relationship with Jesus Christ. Joy is a gift from God. It is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. 
But where is this joy to be found? David sang in Psalm 16, In your presence is the fullness of joy. In your right hand there are pleasures forever. We read in Ephesians chapter 5 that when the Holy Spirit comes and fills a community of believers, they begin to speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. They sing and make melody in their hearts to the Lord. This is why Paul and Silas could sing in a prison in Philippi. This is why you and I can sing in the bleakest circumstances, because we have a God who fills us with joy. We have a God who can turn our mourning into dancing. We have a God who can make the weeping of the night to be followed by joy in the morning. God deserves to be worshipped and praised, irrespective of our circumstances. But notice the sequence of events in this chapter. It begins with an honest confession before God. It is then followed by an earnest crying out unto the Lord. In verse 5, David says, I have trusted in your unfailing love. When all has been said and done, what matters is this, our trust in the unfailing love of God. The Christian life can be distilled down to two things, our trust in God and our love for others. The Apostle Paul, in many of his letters, he thanks God when he sees two things in the churches, faith in the Lord Jesus and love for the saints. Every sickness has some symptoms, and to check the health of our Christian life. Look for these two things. How am I doing with regard to my faith in God? And how am I doing with regard to my love for others? When we talk openly with God, we will finally reach the place of trusting Him. This has been my experience. I began many conversations with God in sorrow, or perhaps even in frustration. By, but I ended those conversations in the firm knowledge that I can trust the love of a good God. In verses 5 and 6, David gives the reason for his singing. Firstly, he rejoices in God's salvation. Beloved, as New Testament believers, we have a song of redemption that even the angels cannot sing. On the darkest night and in the coldest winter, our hearts can burst in praise for our redemption. Secondly, David sings because the Lord has dealt bountifully with him. He has been good with me. He thinks of all that God has done for him. When we are honest in God's presence, He will begin to show us how good He really has been to us. And then we can join with David and sing, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not His benefits. How did this change in attitude come about in David? David's attitude changed when his eyes became enlightened. May we pray this prayer for our fellow brothers and sisters, that God would enlighten their eyes with his truth, so that their perspective will change forever. David's circumstance did not change immediately, but God changed David. Sitting in a cave, David did not know that he would become the greatest king of Israel. God made a covenant with him that his throne would last forever. David did not know that among men he would be the most mentioned person in the Bible, more than a thousand times in the Bible. But the greatest blessing in David's life was his relationship with the Messiah. The Lord Jesus Christ would be born in David's lineage. 
The Son of God would be known as the Son of Man, but he would also be known as the Son of David. And he will be born in the city of David. How does the New Testament begin? Matthew chapter 1 and verse 1 says, The record of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the Son of David. In Revelation, the Lord reveals that he has the keys of David, and he is the root of David. Beloved, it is the same with us. This morning, perhaps your circumstances have dimmed your vision, but God sees differently. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. So, beloved, in our trials, let us be honest with God. Let us turn to him in prayer. Let us allow his word to enlighten our eyes. And let us trust in his unfailing love. We worship a God for whom one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. When we ask how long, we think of time. But the Ancient of Days thinks of eternity. The one who said that he is the Alpha and the Omega. He knows the end from the beginning. He has lived all our tomorrows. So today, if you are hurting all alone, and if the pain has become unbearable, the living God is the giver of peace and joy. In your waiting, do not give up. Trust in his unfailing love. We worship the living God who sees us and knows all about us. The living God, El Roy, who saw Hagar in the wilderness. The living God who saw Moses all by himself near the burning bush. The living God who saw David as a lonely shepherd boy in the wilderness near Bethlehem, and God made him king. The living God answers prayer. He can turn our turmoil into tranquility. So let us wait upon the Lord, waiting with expectation. More than watchmen wait for the morning, we wait for the Lord. When we ask how long, the eternal God, the one who has no beginning or end, he answers in a little while. In First Peter chapter 5 and verse 10 we read that our suffering is for a little while. In First Peter chapter 1 and verse 6 we read that our distress is for a little while. Beloved, today we are not only waiting for something to change, we are also waiting for someone to appear. We wait for the appearing of the one who loves us and who released us from our sins by his blood. The church waits for her bridegroom, the one who was and who is and who is to come. He is returning soon. Even as we ask how long before our deliverance, let us also ask how long before our Lord returns. As we wait earnestly for the return of our King, may our lamps be filled with oil. Before he went to the cross, the Lord Jesus kept telling his disciples, we read this in John chapter 16, in a little while, in a little while. In Revelation chapter 22, we hear the Lord say three times, I am coming quickly. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. This morning, let us pour our hearts before God, who is able to keep us from stumbling and to make us stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy. Will you join with me in praying and surrendering before the Lord? Gracious God, a loving Heavenly Father, Father, we worship you because you are the sovereign God. You exercise your will in the heavens, on earth, 
in the seas and in all the deeps. We worship you because you are the Ancient of Days, who reigns from eternity to eternity. And yet, O oh Lord, you dwell with the contrite in spirit. So this morning, Lord, we pour our hearts before you. Many of us have been facing the how long question for a long time. But we know that you are a God who can turn our mourning into dancing. We know that you are a God who can change our circumstances by your word. So this morning we cry out, Lord, answer us. Enlighten our eyes. Give a fresh perspective, O Lord. Remind us of our hope and our inheritance and the great power that you possess. Thank you for being a God of promise and a God of power. Thank you that you give us a song that we can sing before you. Thank you for the joy that pour, you pour into our hearts by your Spirit. Father, I pray especially for anyone who is listening this morning. I pray that you will fill their hearts with your love. I pray that you will fill their minds with your will. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will fill us with your presence so that we can rejoice in your presence. And Lord, we worship you, that you reign supreme, you are victorious, you will be victorious forever. And Lord, we look with earnestness, we wait for your return as you appear in the clouds so that we will be with you forever. We thank you, Lord, that you are in control over every situation. Before a word is on our tongue, you know it, Lord. There is no place that we can flee from your presence. And so we thank you for the promise of your presence and for the promise of your favor. We thank you, Father, for what you accomplished on the cross through your Son, for the reconciliation that makes it possible for us to come into your presence and to pray. So we thank you for this morning time. We give you all the glory. We ask all this in the most excellent name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. This is my desire to